a couple weeks ago, before I ever went to camp and everything, when I was blocking out all of these messages, um, I watched a little bit of uh, the Olympic trials. And I don't know if you saw this or not, but Simone Biles did something that she almost never does. She, she messed up. She messed up hard. She, she, was mess, she was doing the balance beam, and she messed up so badly, she almost fell off. She actually had to just jump off and get back on and start over. But she did that. She got right back up on, and she started over, and she went on to come in first place overall and win the whole thing. Now, what's, if you know Simone Biles at all, it's amazing she even messes up at all. But what really inspired me and all the people that day was, was that she just kept right on going when she did mess up. And that's, that's really an admirable thing in, all, in itself that Jesus loves. It's called persistence. We experienced that at camp this week. Uh, by Wednesday, I think a, a, a prayer request went out, and I appreciate so much your prayers. We felt them. God answered those. But by Wednesday morning, uh, this week of camp, um, it was rough. It was getting rough. We had some kids that were just going home for no apparent reason. Uh, a lot of us felt sick. It, it was just, it, it, it just felt really hard. And if it would have just been up to us as human beings and just how we felt, we probably all would have just come home on Wednesday morning. But we, we, re, we rallied, we prayed, we asked God, we challenged each other. I, we, we know God has something more going on this week than just us giving up. We're not going to give up. And by the end of the week, it was amazing. We actually had, um, among all the other blessings, we had five baptisms. Three of those were from Morrison Hill. And we're so, we're so excited for God's blessings. <clears throat> and all of that would have just not happened if we would have given up. None of this is to, to brag on, uh, on us or anything. That's just how it's done. That's what has to happen. And when we don't persist, we lose all the progress we could have made. So that's why we're going to start here with this thing. We're going to say this together. Jesus loves persistence. Uh, he loves us. That was so beautiful today. He loves us. But here's, here's something else. He loves what's real. He loves what's true. He loves the things that he knows are going to be best for us. The things that get stuff done in the world. And one of those things is persistence. He talked a lot about that. Let's say it one more time. Jesus loves persistence. Almost all of his parables actually involve some sort of a process where, that takes some time, takes some patience, takes some wisdom, and a relentless pursuit of a goal. Whether it's somebody trying to grow things in a garden or on a farm, whether it's somebody doing a job and being held accountable to do that job, that, that idea of persistence is one of the really common threads through almost every story that Jesus told us about his kingdom. He clearly values not only the things he wants us to do, but the idea of persistence itself. As always, we're going to start today with the clear meanings that Jesus himself gives us to try to understand these stories, and then we're going to build on that. And I also want to remind you there's endless depth in addition to these, but we start here. Luke 11, then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. Now, really quickly, give you some context here. There's two things happening in this story. In their culture, this story would have had a lot more meaning than to us. Uh, one was the idea of hospitality. If you invited someone into your home, that was a much bigger thing than just a, a fun thing to do that night. That was a big deal. If somebody stayed at your home. I, I wish I could tell you more. But it, that, knowing that makes this and a lot of other Bible stories make a little bit more sense. It was a huge deal to invite someone into your home and share a meal. The second thing is they also have this thing, common courtesy, just like we do. You don't just endlessly mess with your friends. You don't take advantage of people. So both of those are happening here. The one guy's been required to offer hospitality, but he's kind of taken advantage of his friend. And you can see that in the next line. Suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, this is Jesus talking, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Now, again, we got to start with what Jesus is talking about. He's trying to just teach us that persistence is a good thing. He's not saying we should be shameless. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? He's not telling us to, to take advantage of our friends. He's saying that even in a broken situation, even in a messed up situation, even when people are being selfish and rude and, and, and it's not all the way it's supposed to be, even in those situations, persistence still works sometimes. So, of course, being persistent in the things that God wants us to do and in our prayers makes sense. Another place to start to really get to depth of what these parables mean is, is what the biographers of Jesus actually say about it itself. They were there. They heard it. For example, Luke 18. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. There was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because of this widow, I'm sorry, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. I've heard people actually preach this, this story and say that the, the judge represents God. He doesn't represent God. He is an evil judge. He's not just. He's a bad judge. Jesus is saying even an unjust, corrupt judge will eventually grant somebody justice if they're pestered hard enough. He's not, he's not describing his father. He's saying... If you pester even somebody who's completely selfish and wrong enough, sometimes that'll even work. Just imagine what will happen when you go to your heavenly father who desperately wants justice on this planet. He's not saying God is unjust and hard to pray to. He's saying God is way better than this dude. And the Lord said, listen. To what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Here's another great story. Short, simple, totally to the point of persistence. He told them there's still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like, <clears throat> excuse me. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. Do you see that? I mean, it's almost, it's so short, it's almost a metaphor, not a story. But every great story has some conflict. There's some conflict in one lady trying to knead 60 pounds of dough. To make sure the yeast goes all the way through it. Reminds me of Lottie O'Brien that used to run Mama Mia's and did all the way until the end of her life. I can't imagine how much work that lady did day in, day out. It was absolutely incredible. But she did it. She just kept going, kept going, kept going. That's persistence. And persistence is what makes a bunch of flour and salt and sugar and some yeast turn into more than 60 pounds of bread. It's that relentless effort. I told you I'd come back again to the story of the ten bridesmaids in Matthew 25. I'd like to just kind of read that to you again. This is what those lamps actually look like. This is from archaeology. These are real things that Jesus was talking about. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take, <coughs> excuse me, the foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. That's an interesting detail. They weren't all perfect. Even the ones who came prepared fell asleep. I think that's important. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. 
Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. One more time. So many layers of beautiful truth in this. Uh, one thing that uh, is worth considering is that very frequently throughout the whole Bible, oil is used to represent the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to be able to do what God wants us to do. But we've got to always start with the context of what Jesus said he was talking about, what his biographers said he was talking about. And Jesus here himself says very clearly he's talking about the end of time. He's talking about us being ready and staying alert. Last week we mentioned this story, and that, that's really the point. He says it's about we've got to be ready when he comes back. But, but I mentioned it this morning because there's also one really important detail. The reason that the wise ones were prepared was because they had planned ahead. When they committed to this job, they brought the oil, extra oil with them. They didn't know how long it was going to take. They didn't know how much oil they were going to need. But they were committed. They were going to get the job done regardless. And so when it took a long time, they were already ready. And the big underneath thing, the big foundational idea underneath persistence is a commitment at the beginning. You commit 100% before you even start. You prepare before you start. Does that, does that register? And here's another foundational idea of persistence. It might sound really obvious, but, but it's, it's important. Let's say it together. We must put God and others first. Say it one more time. We must put God and others first. And here, here's why. When we focus on our own needs, when we focus on our own desires... If we're doing whatever we're doing for our, any relationship we're in, any friendship or romantic relationship, uh, church relationships, things we're doing for the community, if we're doing it for the feels, if we're doing it for ourselves, if we're doing it trying to look good, if we're focusing on our own needs and desires, all of these things that are otherwise wonderful things actually don't do any good for anybody. When we're selfish, when we're in it for ourselves, spirituality and marriage and family and church and serving others sometimes cause more damage than they do good. Because all of these are things that Jesus created. They're all relationships and, and ideas and models of his relationship with us. They're all things that he created and they require intimacy, self-sacrifice and teamwork to work. They only work when we're focused on other things people. When we focus on God and on other people, all of these things work and everybody is blessed. When we focus on ourselves, it doesn't work for anybody. God's not pleased. The people we're serving aren't pleased. And we don't get our needs met, even though that's what we're focused on. It's one of the biggest misunderstandings in the world today is that we're taught to look out for yourself. Make sure that whatever relationship you're in, whatever thing you're in, whatever job you're in, that you're getting your needs met. You're, you're, you make sure people are treating you the way you want to be treated. Life just doesn't work that way. It does work God's way when we focus on him and others. Even in grace, even in things that it's all about God, he, he wants, a, you can see these ideas. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. The idea that we can just, anybody can just come to God even if they're not his people, they're not called by his name. They're not repenting of anything. They're not sorry for anything. They're not changing anything. They're not committing to anything that he wants. But they can just say, hey, please forgive me from our sins. And God says, okay. That's nonsense. That's fiction. It's not real. It's nowhere in the Bible. It's the opposite of the Bible. Luke 11. Jesus again. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who asks, I'm sorry, the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. 
Every time I read this, I try to remind people in the original language that, that that verb ask means ask and keep on asking relentlessly. Same with the other two, seek and knock. You, you ask and you keep asking. You knock, you keep knocking, you seek, you keep seeking. It's all about persistence. Jesus says, which of you fathers? Again, he's not comparing God to a bad father. He's saying even bad fathers get this. Imagine what God gets. Which of you fathers, if a son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then know you are evil, how, if, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And here's the third big thing we've got to understand. There's several of these, but persistence is so key, and we've got to remember all of these things. Let's say, up, say this together. Giving up ruins everything. One more time. Giving up ruins everything. I don't care what you're working at. I don't care how long you've worked at it. I don't care how much dedication you had at some point. If you quit before it's done, you've lost the whole thing. You've wasted your time the whole time. The thing doesn't get done. Are you with me? That, that's just, that's so common sense. It's real, but that's how it is. There's literally, a lot of times we quit because we're afraid of failing, but there are only two ways to guarantee failure. One is never trying in the first place, and the other is quitting. And Jesus tells us in several different ways over the course of all the scriptures and all these stories that if we try our best, he's not so much worried about the specific results as the trying our best part. That we're investing what he's given us. That we're taking it very seriously. That he's given us whatever time or resources or relationships that he has given us. And we're investing those for him. It's not that we're going to be all held accountable for the exact, that we all get the exact same results. We're all going to be held accountable for using what he gave us. If you've got extra, he's going to wonder why you spent that extra on just you every time. If you've got extra anything, time or emotion or, or, or money or anything, he, he's, he's saying, you, you, you know, that's, I'm expecting you to bless the world with that. But giving up, when we give up, we forfeit all the progress we've already made and all the progress we could keep making. Winston Churchill was not a Christian. I don't like all of his language, but man, he was good at leading people through a big war. Here's something he said was, if you're going through hell, keep going. I think that's really good advice. Dr. King is somebody I really respect. He said this, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. The Apostle Paul said this with the help of the Holy Spirit, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we, if we do not give up. Would you read that one out loud with me, that whole, that whole passage there? Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And what happens if we do give up? Probably not going to get that harvest. Giving up ruins everything. Here's the last one. We're getting in with some hope here, some, some joy. I'll wrap up with a, a little bit of other stuff too. Some, one more story from Jesus. But this big idea, I need you to say this with me. Faith, hope, and love create persistence. Faith, hope, and love create persistence. Here's what I mean by that. When we truly build our lives on Christ's teachings, when we genuinely focus on God and on others, persistence is more of a byproduct of that than an additional thing to add to our list. In other words, you can't help but persist if you really care. When you understand how important something is, when, you, when you're doing it for somebody else, for God or for others, when you understand that other people, God and others, are depending on you, you can't help but persist. You can't sleep. You can't just give up. You can't because you know that you're responsible to get something very important done. We just keep digging deeper. We keep trying harder. We keep refusing to give up because we can't go back to being shallow and being selfish when we're 100% committed. If we really believe 
So much so that we take action. That's faith. If we really believe, so much so that even in the darkest moments, we're holding on to what's really true. And we're, we're thinking and setting our hearts and our minds on what's to come. That's hope. If we really do set our hearts and our actions in the direction of God and others, that's love. And when we really do all of that, persistence is almost automatic. You can't quit when you really believe and you really hope and you really love. I believe that's why Jesus said those are the greatest. Because it's the only thing I know of that pro produces the kind of persistence Jesus loves. Another story, set of stories we keep going through this series is that of Tolkien and his friends, the Inkling, C.S. Lewis, and several others. Part of why they were so successful for so many years and in so many different ways is because they worked together for a really long time. They stayed at it for a really long time. It wasn't just a couple of glorious years. They, this was a lifetime of relationship and work and prayer and collaboration. It was really cool. And in the stories they wrote, we see this. For example, again, from The Lord of the Rings, there were two characters, uh, Mary and Eowyn, that I'd like to highlight, highlight today. Mary was one of the hobbits, probably one of the least qualified to be on the team, the Fellowship of the Ring. He, he didn't really have any big specific responsibilities. And yet because he stayed in the game, he stayed faithful the whole time, he actually ended up playing a crucial part in several different situations simply because he never gave up. Eowyn was one of the uh, royal family of uh, King Theoden that we talked about last time. And even when he was... Uh, seemed to be completely beyond hope. She was still faithful to her people. And even when she was rejected in many different ways and told she couldn't participate, she was not allowed to even try, Eowyn still stepped up. She still had the courage and the unwavering resolve to go out and do what needed to be done. The two of them actually ended up teaming up at the end and made a massive impact. Here's why. Neither of them were in it for themselves. They simply could not, listen, they could not give up. They could not do nothing while their friends went to war. If you could watch this clip, this is actually from the extended version of the stories. That's how much of a nerd I am, but this is great. Take heart, Mary. It will soon be over. My lady. You are fair and brave and have much to live for. And many who love you. I know it is too late to turn aside. I know there is not much point now in hoping. If I were a knight of Rohan, capable of great deeds, but I'm not. I'm a hobbit. I know I can't save Middle-earth. I just want to help my friends. Frodo. Sam. Pippin. More than anything, I wish I could see them again. Prepare to move out! Make haste! I love those guys probably way too much. That's good stuff. One last story. Again, I told you you'd come back to this last week. It's the story of the sheep and the goats. It's more of a metaphor, really. As it starts, Jesus actually doesn't say, once there was a shepherd or something like that. He actually is saying, this is me coming back. This is what it's going to be like. It's just going to be like this. It's a, a simile. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him. 
He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes. You clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Notice these are all things people did. They're not things they they felt guilty about or felt passionate about or wanted to raise awareness about. They're things they did. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice this is not a parable. This is not a fictional Hades kind of situation. He's telling us here exactly what's going to happen. This is him talking about what's real. Eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's the real hell. That's not a metaphor. That's real. Just wanted to point that one out. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a Sorry, I got lost. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. Let us not become weary in doing good. For we will receive the, proper, the harvest at the proper time if we do not give up. This morning as we wrap up together, I I hope you hear again a message of hope and conviction, not condemnation. I'm not trying to judge anybody. I'm not trying to say that everybody in our group is just wrong and selfish and terrible people. And everybody out there, wherever you are, I don't even know who's watching today. But here's what I know. If we're shallow, if we're selfish in any way at all, that's not going to work. What will work is when we are selfless, when we focus on God and others. When we, like Jesus, learn to love persistence because we know that that's what works. When we have real faith and real hope and real love and that kind of automatically produces persistence in us. When we, like the wise virgins, we come prepared to go the long haul the day we make that commitment. When we, like the sheep in the last story, we actually get stuff done. We don't just kind of feel convicted about it. We go out these doors and we actually do those things. That's the hope. That's what I'm asking you to make a commitment to this morning. No matter how much you've already done that, I'm asking you to take it to the next level. Watch what God does. As we stand, as we sing, if you've got a public decision to make, I invite you to make that. Please make it. Please make it and let us share in that. Let us celebrate with you. Let us welcome you. Let us baptize you. Let us do whatever needs to happen. But let us all make that commitment as we come before God right now.